and he's also a global network associate professor at the Tender School of Engineering in New York City. And uh, he's, she's leading uh, the research center for interacting urban network called CITIES. And between 2010 and 2017, Monica was the director of the research group Traffic Engineering at the ETH Zurich uh, in Switzerland. And before that, uh, she actually worked at uh, Bain Company, which is a management consulting company. And uh, Monica holds PhD and a master's in CEE from uh, UC Berkeley, where actually we spent quite some time together. Um, so today, actually, she will talk about automated module vehicles, which is a new concept, and she will focus on some future applications. So thank you again for being here, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry about the whole mess. Um, for sure, I haven't fallen asleep yet, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is late for me, so bear with me if I'm slow uh, responding questions and, um, you know, uh, I'm tired, but uh, anyway, thank you for the invitation. And I am also sorry that we have to move it to Wednesday, but the weekend here is Friday and Saturday, and then this will be kind of in the middle of the weekend. So thanks for the flexibility on that and for the invitation. Let me try to share my screen. Can you please confirm if you see? I'm, I'm yes, not see that. due to Microsoft Teams, so sorry. So uh, as you say, I'm Monica Menendez and I work in, in Abu Dhabi, but the work that I'm gonna be presenting today has been mostly done by Igor Dakish. He's a current PhD working with me. Uh, he's in ETA Zurich because I hired him before leaving ETA Zurich. Kai Diyan, who's a former PhD and now a postdoc in Stanford and Davi Hanon, who is a postdoc here in my group in Abu Dhabi. Um, and I'm going to be talking about automated modular uh, vehicles and some future applications, in particular public transportation and emergency medical services. Now, absolutely everything that I'll present today is work in progress. I cannot refer you to some papers because we haven't published them yet. Uh, so not everything that I will present is fully good and we're still running many experiments. Still, I'm presenting it because I think it's very cool and the technology is it's interesting and there is a lot of potential for it. So I'm going to start by describing such technology in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, it consists of modular and fully automated uh, units that can either go together or operate individually. When they go together, they form a single vehicle of higher capacity. And the idea of these units is that they can couple and decouple while moving. And this offers additional flexibility because you get variable capacity. You also get um, the ability of people to transfer between the units. Uh, you get the ability of larger vehicles to decompose into smaller vehicles that take different directions or vice versa, smaller vehicles that come together and form a larger single vehicles, so, sort of an organized platoon, but it's a platoon that allows you to transfer in between the vehicles. Now the technology is electric or these vehicles are electric. So in theory, they're cleaner and they're automated. So that gives you all the advantages provided uh, with automation. The capacity, they're very small units. The capacity is about six people if everyone is sitting, 20 people if everyone is standing, which is a lot of capacity for the size of a unit. And I think it's 10 people if you have a mix of sitting and standing. So now if I think, or if we describe the main features or differentiation points of this technology, those would be autonomy, the fact that they're electric, they offer variable capacity, and they provide en route transfer between ports, uh, or they allow the en route transfer between ports. So as I said, I'm going to be talking today about two potential uses. The first one is public transportation. And although the public transportation could leverage all those four features, I'm going to focus in on an application that uh, exploits mostly autonomy and variable capacity. And then in the case of emergency medical services, it could also leverage all features. And I'm going to talk about that later at the end. But the application that I'm going to be focusing on exploits mostly autonomy and the route transfer between pods. So now I'm gonna start the discussion with public transportation. And 
what's the problem with public transportation? Well, okay, public transportation has many problems. So what's the problem that we're addressing uh, with this is demand changes throughout the day. So given that you have fixed bus capacity for any given operator, uh, even for the same route, you might end up with underutilized bus capacity during off-peak periods and insufficient bus capacity during the peak periods. Uh, now, the plan is uh, we're proposing a new dispatching strategy that leverages, as I said, the autonomy and the variable capacity. And so we can reallocate models or pods throughout the day and across multiple lines in order to uh, better address uh, the changes in demand with limited resources. And by limited resources, I mean with a, with a limited vehicle fleet or a limited number of vehicles. Uh, now, how do we do that? Or why do we need this study in the first place? Can we use any of the existing dispatching strategies? Unfortunately, no, because one of the things that we're trying to look at and understand is how these vehicles interact with traffic and the dispatching problem has rarely been addressed under uh, varying traffic conditions. As a matter of fact, traffic conditions are normally not taken into account uh, for decisions regarding the dispatching of public transportation of public transport vehicles. Partly because the interactions between cars and buses are complicated, partly because we don't fully understand them, partly because we have the assumption that um, these interactions are not important for the dispatch. Also, the effects of the dispatch frequency on the passenger dynamics are rarely considered. The, oftentimes, the optimal distribution of the vehicle fleet across bus lines is not analyzed, especially in a dynamic fashion. To the best of my knowledge, there's almost no research on combining splitting modular bus units along uh, fixed bus lines. Now you're starting to see a few papers here and there, but there's not a lot of research on it. Yet, the changes in demand that I mentioned before do create a lot of inefficiencies in the current public transportation system. So employing new technologies to address those really makes sense. Then, how do we do it in terms of math? Well, we propose an optimization framework where the top part is pretty much the same as any typical dispatching problem, but the difference comes in the details. Um, so rather than going into the details of all the equations th that I show you, I'm going to translate all these equations into layman terms. So basically, we minimize operator costs and the user costs, and this is very traditional, as I said. But in uh, this case, the operator cost includes the driver cost in case you have conventional buses, because you can assume an operator might have a combination of modular bus units and conventional buses. And then you have energy consumption, maintenance, uh, wear and tear, et cetera, other costs that are associated with the two types of units, either conventional or um, modular bus units, although the cost might differ. And then we have the user cost. And as I said, we're looking at the total, we're looking at the interactions with traffic. So that means we're estimating the total time travel in the system. And this means the time traveled by the bus users and the waiting time of those bus users, bus transfer times, et cetera, plus the time traveled by car users. Um, so the decision um, variables are the dispatch flow of buses and bus units of each type. And we solve for this subject to the fact that the dispatch flow of buses needs to be positive for obvious reasons. We cannot have minus three buses per hour. Um, and, and that flow of buses, it's, it's uh, bounded. Um, has, there's a minimum and maximum headway, basically, or, or frequency. This is set by the operator normally because of budget constraints or policy restrictions, et cetera. So you have a minimum and maximum headway. The number of dispatch uh, buses must be lower than or equal than the number of dispatch bus units, which makes sense because one bus can have multiple bus units, um, one or more. And the number of combined bus units must be smaller than a certain threshold for each line. This also makes sense because you cannot put a bus with 23 bus units attached, right? You cannot combine 23 bus units because it would be unfeasible for this to move throughout the network, but also you wouldn't have space at the bus stop. Right? So, and the last, the last uh, set of constraints is that the total number of bus units required must be smaller than the vehicle fleet, which also, you know, it's kind of obvious, but we have to put it there. Now, to get all these costs, I mean, in the user costs and the, and the operator costs, we need to model two things, the vehicle dynamics and the passenger dynamics. 
more importantly, we need to do that while we acknowledge and account for the fact that these two things affect each other. They're uh, very much linked. So I'm going to start by describing the vehicle dynamics. And to do that, the first thing we do is abstract the network as a bimodal system. Um, and then we can describe this network with what is called the bimodal macroscopic fundamental diagram. Some people call it the multimodal macroscopic fundamental diagram, MFD, or the three-dimensional 3D MFD. Uh, but basically, this sort of diagram shows a relation between the two modes, buses and cars, at the network level. So in the horizontal axis, uh, you have the car accumulation. So if I take a picture of my network, how many cars would I see in that picture? And then on the vertical axis, and I'm talking about the graph on the left side uh, of this picture, on the vertical axis, you have the bus accumulation. So in that same picture of the network, how many buses would I count? Then based on those two accumulations, we can estimate the, the total network throughput in terms of vehicles per hours, which is this surface that you observe here, the colors here. Uh, we could also do that in terms of passengers. And it really makes sense because the two modes carry have very different occupancies. But for this specific problem, we chose to do it in terms of vehicles because then we're looking at the passenger dynamics of buses in a very detailed manner um, to, to address those changes in demand, et cetera. So anyways, this sort of diagram is quite useful because it allows to capture the trade-off between adding another car or another uh, unit of public transport by modeling the interactions between the two modes. And these interactions are indeed a function of the network topology in part. Um, so for example, whether you have dedicated lanes or where the buses go in separate lanes, or you have shared lanes, mixed lanes, where the buses and the cars are together, et cetera. Now for the car traffic, we model it at the network level using this sort of diagram. And this is very valuable because we don't have nor need any specific information about each car trip, such as origins or destinations. We only need general information at the network level about the, the level of congestion or the general accumulations, right? And to model bus traffic, we do it in more detail because this is what we're trying, you know, the decisions are about the discussion of, of public buses. Um, so to do that, we adopt a cell transmission model inspired approach um, for each segment that is at the segment level. What do I mean by the segment level? We divide each bus line into several segments and the lane allocation is kept constant along any given segment. So it's either a dedicated bus lane or a shared bus lane for each specific segment. Then the process is a bit more complicated, but basically it goes down to modeling these three things separate, but in combination with each other, the 3D MFE, the car traffic and the bus traffic. And there's a lot for the bus traffic because these were modeling in detail. Uh, then we have the passenger dynamics that are pretty much linked to the uh, bus dynamics that I, the vehicle dynamics for the buses that I described before. Uh, to better explain how we model the passenger dynamics, I'm going to focus on a single bus line and use that as an example. Now, remember, we split the bus line into several segments and each has a constant lane allocation. Then each of the segments can have one or more stops or none at all, but then none at all is very easy, right? So let's assume we we'll have multiple stops in a given segment. And then for any given time interval, we'll have a certain number of buses that go through that segment meaning a total passenger capacity that is provided. Some of that capacity is used, some it's, it's not used. Now, during a given time interval, that same time interval, I'm going to have some new passenger demand that is generated along this segment. I'm going to call it segment S. Similarly, we're going to have passengers on the bus that are coming from the prior segment, from segment S minus one, they're on board the bus. And we're going to have passengers that leave segment S and go to the next segment, S plus one, or that simply alight or get off the bus on segment S. Based on all these transferring flows, then we can determine the total number of passengers uh, that are on the, the total number of passengers on board the bus at, at a given interval. And those two can actually board. Um, 
you know, the number of boarding passengers is just, it's basically the minimum between the demand and the capacity that is available, right? So in case the capacity is not enough, we can also estimate how many passengers could board the bus and need to wait for the next bus to come. Now, those who put together will be put together with a newly generated demand in the next time interval to form, you know, the whole demand for that time interval. And then we, recall, we start kind of from the beginning. Now, all of that can be translated again into a bunch of equations uh, over which I won't go in detail. But in general, we are tracking the evolution of the total bus passengers, those on board over time for each individual segment, right? And this includes the ones that were there from before, plus the ones that go in, minus the ones that go out for any given segment. Uh, for the outflow, for the ones that go out, we refer to so we are looking at the ones that are transferring to the next segment, to the segment downstream, and also the ones that are alighting um, within this segment. And then we have to model the or calculate the boarding, which uh, for which we consider both the current demand plus any passengers that couldn't get into the previous in the buses in the previous time intervals because the bus capacity have been reached. Now, I personally think this is quite cool. Um, because, I, because we're doing it, we think it's quite cool, but not, because, not only because we're using these modular pods to address the demand, but we're also taking into account the passenger dynamics, as you saw, at a very detailed level, and we're minimizing the negative effects on traffic. Basically, we're trying to maximize the people mobility across the two modes by taking into account the interactions between them. So have we tested it? Uh, the answer is uh, yes. So let me introduce the kind of experiment we did. First, we use a three-dimensional or bimodal or multimodal MFD for the city of Zurich, Switzerland. And this is work that I had done in Switzerland. And this, uh, that my PhD in Switzerland is doing, and we started when I was there. And this uh, 3D MFD has been estimated based on empirical data, uh, but in a whole different study. So I won't, I won't go over that. Um, then we look at an abstract network inspired also by the city of Zurich. It has five bus lines, and these lines have dedicated segments in the central area and mixed lane or shared lane segments in the periphery. Then we look at uh, varying demand profiles uh, with a low of peak demand for the first and the third hour. We look at three hours in total, and a peak during the second hour. Now for this high peak, we look at three demand scenarios, both for cars, which are on the graph on the left, and buses that are on the right, on the graph on the right. A low, a medium, and a high scenario. And then we look at different penetration rates between zero and 100, uh, and I'm talking about penetration rates of the modular technology. So zero would be um, all conventional buses, a system with traditional buses, and 100 would be a system with only modular pods. So, uh, we're interested in learning whether, you know, there are any cost savings for the objective function that we have. So whether we can minimize our objective function uh, in comparison to the current dispatching uh, strategies. And to get there, we test different combinations of demand, penetration rates. And then we also want to look into whether accounting for traffic or not makes sense. Now, the different penetration rates basically give us the value of the automated modular vehicle technology. So we can see how converting buses uh, little by little to uh, traditional buses into pods get us some benefits or not, and whether these benefits become smaller or not as I increase the number of pods, you know, do we have a threshold beyond which it doesn't make sense or beyond which we have to go to actually get uh, benefits? Now, the different demands show me the value or show us the value of the um, proposed model when addressing the, the demand variations that I was mentioning at the beginning as motivation for this research, right? It's the, the kind of flexibility uh, that these modular pods gain, uh, that we gain through these modular pods. And then, I yes? I may ask a question, clarification. Sure. Question. So when we talk about penetration rate, if we talk about, you know, the current vehicles and then um, um, uh, there's electrification, like then we say, okay, 20% of the cars will become electricity cars. So that's easy to understand the penetration rate. Uh, for here, you're talking about uh, the buses and the pods. So yeah. how, do how do I define the penetration rate? That's a very good question. Yes. I had a lot of discussions on the on the definition of it. It might not be the best definition, 
uh, but it's something that is it makes it very simple for the equation. So we assume that a bus, a conventional bus, is equivalent to this many units in terms of capacity. So the capacity of a, a normal bus, you could say 60 or 80, in which case it will be equivalent to three or four units, depending on what you said for the capacity. So um, we will have to substitute a conventional bus by three units. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what I'm saying? So if, if we substitute 100% um, penetration rate, will mean that instead of having 100 conventional buses, we will have 300 uh, modular pods or 400, depending on, on the capacity value that we define. Does that make sense? You said the capacity of the pods is about six. No, so six all sitting or 20 all standing or 10 if you do a mix of standing and sitting. Uh, and you use the uniform um, capacity in your calculation? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Well, what we did was experiment. Uh, I don't have the results in the presentation, but what we did was to check what happens when we change the capacity, you know, like mm -hmm. instead of traditional buses, instead of having a capacity of 60, it has a capacity of 80 or whatever, we change it. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, honestly, but mm -hmm. we, did, we, we try those. But that, that's a very good question because actually we spent some time discussing how do we define penetration rate in this case when it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and yes, please feel free to interrupt me because I'm looking at my slides. So I don't see, plus I don't see any faces anyways, because my, I don't know how to use this. I cannot see the grid anyway. So just interrupt me if you have questions, feel free to do that. Um, okay, the last thing that we wanted to check was whether accounting for traffic makes sense or not. Uh, just to check the value of the proposed mo model that considers the bimodal interactions, uh, the, you know, the whole idea of the 3 d MFD and everything. It, it, it adds quite a bit of complexity, so it's invaluable. That was a question. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, when you evaluate accounting for the traffic or not, I was thinking uh, you were talking about penetration rates, and you said you know uh, it does not uh, make too much difference if you use a lower capacity pod or higher capacity pod. But no, if we use a different conversion rate between between buses and pods. So if I say a bus is equivalent to three pods versus a bus is equivalent to four pods, when we're looking at the at the trends on the penetration rate, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah. But it will affect the traffic, right? Yeah. Because when you have two numbers of pods. Yes, it will affect the traffic. But what I'm what I'm talking about is the trends that we will observe at the end. The I, you know, the the traffic. Yes, I agree. So instead of having a 7.2, you will get an 8.5 on whatever number you pick. But the trends that I'm going to be discussing at the end, mm -mm. Uh, don't worry. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first graph that I'm going to show you is the total improvements in terms of you know, the total objective function, user cost plus operator cost. And the black bars here and the left axis is uh, shows the improvement in absolute values. And this is in Swiss francs because it was done based on data from Zurich. Um, all the data is actually based, it's real data from Zurich, right? The red line and the right axis shows the percentage compared to a system with only conventional buses. And then the different bar colors represent different penetration rates. Uh, and we went from, from uh, here we show 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and one. We did all the ones in the middle, but as you will see, there's not a lot of difference. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to plot them all, right? No. The different groups, that's the last thing, is that the different groups of bars uh, show the represent different combinations of demand. So L stands for low, M for medium, H for high, and the first letter stands for the car demand, and the second letter stands for the bus demand. So MH will be medium car demand, high bus demand. Now, the first thing to notice is that the proposed system outperforms the bus dispatching system with only conventional buses. Uh, all results are positive, and the improvements range between 10 and 20%, more or less. Um, now, as the penetration rate increases, the penetration rate of modular pods increases, the improvements also increases, but the rate of improvement decreases with more and more units. So 
basically you get a lot of bang for your buck introducing a new pot. And as you add more and more, they become less and less valuable. In other words, just a few pots can get you a lot of flexibility, a lot of value because they get you a lot of flexibility. So operators might not have to convert the whole fleet, just a few units. And this is a sort of insight that I referred to before you, you when I said this don't change on whether I'm, you know, uh, whether I'm looking at conventional buses that are carry 60 people or conventional buses that carry 80 people. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, can I ask yeah. one more question? Sure. Um, so when you convert the convention of buses to the several pods, like for one to several pods, are you still keep the transit network features? Like the stops will be the same? Yeah, the stops are the same and that actually constrains how many pods you can have together, right? As I said, you cannot have 23 pods together, pods together because they wouldn't fit a bus stop. But the pods are actually quite small. I forgot the average. I think it's about three meters or something in, in length, which is smaller than a car. Because there's no driver or anything, the whole space is used for people uh, for, for five years. So that means that, yeah, go ahead. What I want to say is this is the most conservative benefit analysis because actually when you have the pods, you can change the transit network and then actually will give more flexibility. Oh, yes, yes, I'll talk about that later. This is this is assuming a fixed line, same stops, everything. But you can certainly create a more flexible transport network. Absolutely, this will be like the most basic, the most conservative analysis, exactly. This will be the lower bound for the benefits that you could get out of, out of pods, agree. I yeah. will stop asking questions until the end. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay, uh, no, I'm okay. I mean, I'm absolutely okay. The, I will talk about that in a few slides, but you're absolutely okay. This will be a lower bound for the kind of benefits because you could really make the whole system more flexible. Okay, going back to the slides and then I'll talk about that uh, later. Um, what I was saying is uh, that, ah, okay, so the as the penetration rate um, increases, then you get more benefits, but at a decreasing rate, right? And then the largest improvements happen for when you have low demands, uh, either low car demands or low bus demands. As the demand of either of the two increases, as you move to a right on this graph, the benefits decrease. And this happens because when you have low car demand, you can you, you do have a lot of flexibility to dispatch a bunch of uh, units separate or individually or whatever you want, because there's not really, that much, they don't have a lot of impact on car because there's almost no cars on the system. But as the demand increases, um, you start actually dispatching the units closer together, uh, kind of a more traditional bus. And let me, this is actually reflected on this slide. The, the arrangement of the slide is the same uh, in terms of the bars, the colors, etc. But what I show here is the average number of combined modular units for, for a given bus, right? And what you can see is that as the demand increases, you have more modular units together because you want to cause less disruptions to traffic. And, and this is more modular units together and longer headways. So on the extreme, it actually behaves as a conventional bus, fully conventional bus system it, on the extreme. We haven't observed the extreme here, but on the extreme, it will behave as a, as a fully conventional bus system. Now, um, the last question is whether it makes sense or not to take into account the bimodal interactions. And as I said, these interactions are normally ignored because on the frequency setting problem, the assumption is that the travel times or the bus speeds are independent of the bus dispatching strategy. Some people say they might be dependent on traffic or not, but so far I haven't seen anyone that says they depend on the dispatching strategy. And what we're claiming is that Whatever your dispatching strategy is, might affect traffic. And, uh, you know, if traffic becomes more congested because your dispatching strategy, that congestion might ultimately affect your travel times, uh, especially if you have mixed lanes. So what we do here is compare the results of the proposed approach to those that you would obtain on a simplified problem that doesn't consider cars at all. So it will be a similar dispatching, um, how do you say, rational, or, or, or logic, but we wouldn't account for this loop with the cars. And the arrangement, again, of the bars is the same, 
Uh, and you can see that there are significant improvements just by considering the cars. One thing that we do here is that we add the 0% the case. So this will be a case where all buses are conventional, but we still want to know if it makes sense to account for cars in a dispatching strategy. And not surprising when the demand is low or the penetration rate is low, um, it doesn't really make sense because there are not that many interactions because there are not that many cars in the system. But as the car demand increases, even for low penetration rates, it starts becoming important uh, to look into these uh, relations. So now in summary, for wrapping this part of the presentation on public transport, what have we learned so far? Well, first, the flexibility that is introduced with modular bus units allow us to better manage the dispatch frequencies and the location of resources across multiple lines. We had five lines and what we were doing basically is the, the five lines have different demands, so we are reallocating resources between them. Uh, the proposed system significantly outperforms existing dispatching uh, systems. The number of combined modular units and the dispatch frequencies changes with the demand and the users benefit mostly during uh, low car demand scenarios. And even a few modular units can bring high value to both users and the operators. And last but not least, taking into account multimodal inter interactions is also very valuable, even for the dispatching of conventional buses, especially when you have a lot of cars on the system, as we saw. So what's next then for public transportation? And this is in part to answer the question from Yuyu. What we discussed today was flexible dispatching strategies for fixed bus lines. Um, and next, uh, very easy thing to do, if you were to leverage the transfer between pods, will be to have flexible bus lines with bus stops. Keeping. So the, the idea of keeping bus stops has been proposed in the literature, but it's really hard to implement in real life because uh, you, know, you ultimately want to make sure that your passengers get to their destinations, right? But when they can switch between pods, then uh, that gives you additional flexibility. Now, the next level of flexibility is to have um, flexible lines. So you, you, don't, you don't stick to a specific routes anymore, but then you have to use uh, these as feeder services or uh, flexible last mile services where you have um, all pods coming together in the arterial, kind of in a, like in aviation, you know, for the main, for the main, um, Connections, you have all the pods coming together and people making transfer between them. And then uh, they separating and going into the suburbs or into the individual destinations later or vice versa at the beginning of the trip. And another, basically you can think of any other variations that require kind of more on-demand operations, right? And in all cases, one thing that we need to start looking at at some point, but we haven't yet, is the fact that these are electric. Uh, units and this is important because it might affect the range the sort of services that you can offer etc because you have to recharge them right and recharge them takes time okay so that's it for public transport so far <laughs> yeah that's it for public transport so i'm going to switch gears um to talk about emergency medical services ems and ems are are very important for the health safety and, and overall welfare of a community because they provide pre-hospital care, stabilization, and the transportation to the hospitals where then you can get the more advanced treatments, right? Uh, so as I said, I'm gonna be focusing on the technology on, on an application that leverages mostly autonomy and then route transfer. What's the problem with uh, EMS? Well, the same as public transport has many problems, but but here in the in the case of EMS, the inefficient utilization of resources is it's huge, mostly due to very long hospital discharge times. So once the ambulance gets to the hospital, it has to discharge the patient. It takes a lot of time. It's just paperwork. Nothing is really happening yet. The personnel and the whole equipment is kind of blocked there. And then you also have very long journeys into the hospital within in some cases. Uh, so after the patient has been initially treated on site, now he's, he or she is just being transported to the hospital. Uh, so in many occasions, nothing is really happening to the patient. Yet again, the personnel and the equipment are kind of blocked with him um, while they transfer to the hospital. And this is especially true in rural areas because the, the distances to the hospital tend to be rather long, right? 
Uh, and interestingly enough, there is an EMS act of the 1970s uh, that it said it is stated that 95% of the requests should be reached within 10 minutes in urban areas and 30 minutes for the rural areas. Now, I guess we would all agree that the um, impacts of the response time on survival rates are probably independent of where you live, right? Uh, whether you live in or, uh, urban or rural. And moreover, the national, the U.S. National Fire Protection Association suggests a target of eight minutes for at least 90% of emergencies. Uh, and then another, uh, in, in addition, you might also have excessive response times when you have very limited resources or kind of unprecedented situations. Think about the, you know, during COVID, the, um, the waiting time for, for ambulances in New York skyrocketed. And another example is the recent explosion last year on, in Beirut. I had the person that was working on this, Gabi, uh, Gabi, she's from Lebanon and she was actually there when this happened. So we were working at it and she, she realized that this was the perfect place to, to, to implement some of these ideas because there's suddenly a peak in the demand and very, very limited resources. So they have to start sending people outside actually of the city, which adds the strain and puts more uh, pressure on the resources because now you have very long transportation times, et cetera. So anyways, how are we planning to address this? Well, we introduced a completely new type of response operations. And I'm saying completely new type because to the best of my knowledge, I have never seen the modular bus units being used for, uh, no, modular units being used for EMS. Uh, so in this case, we um, look at using two units that can couple together while on, on, on route, a medical transport unit and a life support unit. Now, a life support unit is the unit that has all the equipment and, and the, the personnel, the most qualified personnel, et cetera. It will be equivalent to most type of ambulances these days. And the medical transport unit is, is a cheaper version that might have some basic equipment and maybe some basic personnel, but or, or maybe no personnel at all. And this is equivalent to uh, medical transport fleets that some cities around the world have. Um, now, the idea is that these two different types of units can be combined and run for the transfer of patients um, after you know, they have received some basic care and they're just being transported to hospital or for the transfer of, patient, of personnel in case you have very limited personnel um, and, or equipment. Now, for this presentation, I'm going to focus focusing on patients. Now, can we use traditional approaches to this or why do we need to study? Well, as I said, uh, there's a lot of, the system is plagued with excessive response times and inefficient utilization of resources, especially in areas uh, with limited resources or long distances like rural settings or under disaster conditions. Uh, there is a clear need to reduce these response times and arrival times to the hospital while maximizing the service coverage. And there's no existing approach that leverages automated motor vehicle technology to do this. So it just makes sense to do it. So when to discuss how we do it, I'm going to start by introducing a traditional operation, and I'm going to call it Operation A for simplicity. So let's assume you have this network, um, and you have uh, the EMS vehicle, the emergency vehicle, and then you have um, a hospital, the square, and uh, an emergency itself, the Pentagon. And once the emergency call is made from the Pentagon, uh, the EMS, assuming there's an EMS vehicle available, it gets dispatched. It gets to the emergency and provides on-site care um, to the patient. This is the first care that the patient receives or the first intervention. The time until it gets there is called, it's very important, it's called response time. And this is the 8, 10, 30 minute threshold that I was mentioning before, right? Now, after that, uh, first care is provided on site. The patient is placed in the ambulance and then transported to a hospital. And uh, this is called time to hospital. It's the time elapsed from the moment you get the first care intervention until the moment you get to hospital. Uh, so basically, the sum of these two is the total time uh, between the moment you place a call to the moment you get to the hospital. Now, 
operation based a new type of operation that is only possible because we're adding these uh, transfers between life support units and medical transport units. So the first part of the operation is the same, the call is made and the MS vehicle is dispatched. And then he provides some first care at the scene and takes the patient to a hospital. Now the difference is that at some point on this way to the hospital, uh, the life support unit is met or, or meets a medical transfer unit. And then the patient is transferred from the life support unit to a medical transfer unit that continues its way to a hospital. Now uh, for the patient, this doesn't imply any detour or stop as it's transferred on route. Um, but this actually frees up the life support unit at an earlier point in time. And then that life support unit can provide faster service for any future waiting emergency. Then uh, Operation C is similar, but it works the other way around. So once the call is made, we can assume that there's no life support unit available or that the, the life support unit is simply too far, right? So you could actually dispatch a medical transport unit to uh, pick up the patient. And somewhere in route to the hospital, uh, that medical transport unit meets uh, with a life support unit. The patient is transferred. At that point, the person gets the, the first care. Uh, and then the life support unit continues its way to the hospital treating the patient, and the medical transport unit leaves. And what this does is that the medical, you use the medical transport unit to bring the patient closer to a life support unit and to the hospital which ensures an earlier intervention and an earlier arrival to a hospital. Now, if I compare the three types of operations side by side, so you have the three types here at the top, and then you have the timeline for the operations, we can assume that uh, the call is made at the same time for all the three operations. Now, let's compare operations A and B. And for the patient, there's potentially no difference whatsoever because he gets first care at the same time and he gets to the hospital at the same time. Uh, the difference here is that the life support unit gets released earlier so he can go and help the next patient or you know, the next uh, address the future demand. If I compare operations A and B with operation C, then we can see that the first care happens earlier. It doesn't happen on site, it happens on, on, on board the life support unit you know, after the transfer, but it happens earlier. And the arrival to the hospital also happens earlier. Now, if you think about it, operation B doesn't do anything for this patient. But operation B, what it does is that improves, potentially improves your response time for the next patient, for the future demand. While operation C improves the quality of the service for this specific patient, right? Okay, so how do we solve this? problem. Again, it's an optimization where we minimize the response time and the time to hospital, and this is subject to a number of constraints. I won't go over all of them because those are 38 constraints. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to put it in layman terms. So we minimize the response time and the time to hospital. The response time, uh, remember, is the time from the, the moment the call is made until he receives first care. And I say community because it's across all emergencies. And the time to hospital is the time from the moment he gets the first care until he arrives to the hospital. And it's community because it's across all emergencies. Our decision variables are the routing and scheduling decisions for all the vehicles that we have. And this is subject to typical routing and scheduling constraints, time windows and precedence constraints, synchronization for the transfers, and, and the performance metric constraints that kind of link all these vehicle decisions, routing and scheduling decisions to their response time and the time to a hospital. Now to solve the problem, we need a graph representation. So we transform the whole network into a graph and it's a set of nodes and it refers to a physical location on the road, but it can be on the road network, it can be the hospital, the station, the emergency side or, or potential nodes for transfers. And A is a set of arcs representing possible movements. And I say possible because, uh, for example, you first need to get to the patient either at the emergency side or at the transfer before you go to a hospital, right? So it only looks at possible movements. Then we also need to have some sort of rules for the vehicle assignment. So for any vehicle uh, of any given type, you have a sequence of tasks that, the, that should make sense and the timing of those tasks should also be reasonable. So by task, I mean a vehicle moving from one point from one node in the network I to another node J. And the duration of this task uh, includes the travel time from I to J plus the duration of any service that is offered at J. And this depends on the type of node 
uh, that J is so is it a hospital? Is it a transfer? Is it a stage? Um, uh, an emergency site, etc. And in some cases, you have a maximum time that a vehicle can spend or can wait at a given node after finishing his task. So if it's at the station, you can stay there until the next emergency comes. But if it's a transfer point, you cannot stay there because you're in the middle of the street, right? So you actually have to move. Then for the different type of operations, we can model the sequence of tasks for the vehicles involved. So for operation A, it's fairly easy because it involves a single vehicle. But for operation B, it's a bit more complicated because it involves two vehicles and a transfer, and then you need to synchronize the task of these two vehicles and the same for operation C, right? Uh, so now, did we test it? The answer is yes. Again, we use this useful transportation network, and I know many of you are very familiar with this. Um, we have one hospital on the bottom left and one station on the top right. And then we assume a Poisson distribution of emergency calls with an average of either two or three emergencies per hour. Now, two or three might seem like a low number, but it's reasonable for the size of network. And we also assume that the call locations were uniformly distributed over the network. So we would do random draws of a uniform distribution, right? So we use a one hour planning horizon, and then we use a hundred different emergency sets with varying uh, temporal and special instances of emergency calls. Here you have a little more information on the duration of some tasks and other parameters. And one thing that I need to highlight is that this is a deterministic system. So uh, it's not realistic, but this is the first time that anyone proposes something like this. So we're using it as a proof of concept to show kind of the upper bounds for the benefits that you can get, right? Uh, to Because it's deterministic, it means we have visibility. It's not only deterministic, but we have visibility into that one hour of planning horizon. We know the emergencies that are popping up, et cetera. Not realistic, but it gives us an upper bound for the sort of benefits that we could expect, right? Uh, we are now working on how to make work with this on, on real, with real-time information and adding a stochastic part. Uh, but now for all these cases, we look at three scenarios and each corresponding to what we call a different fleet set. So fleet set one is one life support unit. Um, and so it only allows for operations A, operation A. Fleet set three is two life support units, so it's only operation A as well. And fleet set two is uh, one life support, one moment, one medical transport unit, so you can have operations A, B, or C. And we pick, you know, you might think fleet set one and three don't make sense, but basically they give us a lower and upper bound for anything that we can get with fleet set two. So they, they show the value of increasing the fleet size by adding one LS unit. Now, if I compare fleet set one and fleet set two, it's, you, we look at the value of adding one empty unit and introducing the flexibility of operations B and C. And uh, the comparison between set two and set three give us kind of the disbenefits of substituting a life support unit, which is more expensive, but with a cheaper empty unit, but can, that cannot provide on-site intervention. Um, yet it allows you to do operations B and C. So in terms of results, here you have two figures. Uh, the left one is for two emergencies per hour and the right one is for three emergencies per hour. And each figure shows the box plot with the percentage reduction in the objective value for fleet sets two and three in comparison to fleet set one. So basically, all you know, in, in all cases, we get a reduction in the in the response time and the travel time to the hospital because you know, but this is not surprising because in fleet sets two and three, we have two vehicles, and this is been done in reference with fleet set one, with this, which is a single vehicle. Right? So that kind of makes sense. Additionally, as you would expect, the uh, fleet set three has the lowest results or the largest reduction because the two units are life support units and they can provide intervention on site, right? Then fleet set two falls kind of in the middle. Um, and this one uh, shows you the benefits, you know, if compared to, to zero or fleet set one, you can see the benefits of hiring a medical transport unit. Um, which again, I want to highlight that is noticeably cheaper than a life support unit. And these are the disbenefits of using that medical transport unit in lieu of the more expensive life support unit. So now a medical transport unit actually gets you between 60 and 70% of the benefits that you would get with fleet life support unit. Uh, now you might want to ask yourself, is the medical transport unit, does the medical transport unit cost 60 or 70% the price of, of an LS unit? And then you, you can evaluate the trade-off in terms of the cost, right? And whether it makes sense to have more of one kind or the other, et cetera. 
Now, I, uh, one, one thing that I want to highlight is that as we increase the number of emergencies, we expect the system to work even better. Um, so notice that the benefits for uh, fleet set two, as you cannot see them here, but they go from 62% to 70% of the benefits of fleet set three as we go from two to three emergencies. And we're doing tests with higher number of emergencies and we're observing this trend. And this makes sense because the additional flexibility that you get by operations B and C become more relevant as you have more emergencies and limited resources, right? Uh, now, if you look at the results in detail, we see that the introduction of a medical transport unit um, helps you more with the time to hospital than with the response time in comparison to fleet set one. You can see that by comparing the two columns here. So in summary, I'm sorry I'm rushing, but <laughs> we started late. And uh, in summary, what have we learned? Well, there are for sure new types of operations that can be introduced with the modular technology where life support unit uh, and medical transport vehicles can cooperate uh, via the patient transfers. There is definitely potential reduction in fixed and operational costs driven by the addition of medical transport units instead of life support ones. The proposed operations can reduce the time to a hospital significantly. Uh, the benefits are less um, significant for the response times. And moreover, as we increase uh, the size of the network and the number of emergencies, Basically, as the limited resources become more of a constraint, then we would expect that the system uh, works better and the proposed operations bring even larger benefits. So now, today we discuss these new types of operations with en route transfer of patients. We're still working with the transfer of patients and uh, evaluating the model on larger problem instances and then developing a real-time EMS dispatching method that takes into consideration um, the uncertainty uh, that is linked both to the demand and the service characteristics, travel times. Right? That's not taken into account right now. We assume travel times are fixed and we know them, et cetera. We could also extend that to operations with route transfer of medical personnel and equipment, as I mentioned before. And if we were to leverage a variable capacity feature of this technology, we could look at coupling not two, but many units when you have limited medical personnel or equipment that can be then chaired by multiple patients at the same time. So you can be moving patients and, and I'm sorry, personnel and equipment across not two, but multiple units for a while. And as before, at some point, we should acknowledge the fact that these are electric vehicles and then uh, take that into consideration because it might affect the range of services, et cetera. So now if I go back to the four features that are offered for this by this technology, you know, autonomy, electric, the fact that they're electric, they offer variable capacity and then, you know, make it possible to have en route transfers. Um, other applications, you know, surely come to mind. We discussed public transportation and emergency medical services. But if you think about it, this sort of technology lends itself to very well to other types of personal mobility, something along the lines of taxi services kind of combinations or something in between public transport and private transport, right? And uh, it could also be used for delivery services and other logistic settings, uh, something that we're starting to, to look at as well. Um, so what I think it's clear is that it's a promising tool. By the way, I, I'm not associated with the company at all, so I don't get anything out of promoting this technology. I just think it's cool. Uh, but we need to do more research about it. And, and with that, I finish the presentation. Many thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions now. Thank you so much, Monica. Yeah, sorry that because of the confusion of the conference ID, um, yeah, it started it's early, but I had to rush. I was, yeah, I, I was going to okay. off the yeah, I, I think we still can stay a little bit longer if it's okay with Monica and then maybe ask some questions to Monica. So do we have any questions from audience? Do, do we need to raise our hand? <laughs> uh, please do so, so I know the, who's the first. <laughs> first come, first serve. I've done a lot of research on the EMS and trying to locate stations and the response time and try to look up every research paper there is. Is there any papers? Do you have a paper written? No. I, I'll be honest, I get a little confused between we're trying to figure out four, six, eight, 10, 12 minute response times in respiratory versus heart 
failures, et cetera, and whether there's really a benefit in those savings. And then I'm listening to you and I can't quite figure out what your your research is and what you're doing in terms of response time and the benefit. So the response research. times are going down. Um, well, for the cases that we saw, there, uh, I wanted to say, for the specific cases that we saw, I want to say 12 minutes. Um, but I'm not sure now whether 12 minutes is the sum of response time plus time to hospital. Uh, response time. But uh, they were going down on average 12 minutes when we had uh, two emergencies and 13, 14 minutes when we have three emergencies. Um, that 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 relates to the number of units and their frequency of calls. But you're absolutely, actually, are you, absolutely. Are, are, so, are, you, are, you, are you change? Are you changing the medical services actually inside the unit versus the current units? Or are you just strictly dealing with the response time with these these analyses? I'm are you not, getting are you getting yeah, more ahead. sophisticated care inside of these units no, versus the? We're not uh, assuming any changes in care. We're just assuming changes in the response time and time to hospitals. We're not assuming any variations on care, which could be possible or not, but we're not going into that. Okay. okay. And you don't you don't relate these to the, an average site gets two thousand versus three thousand versus five hundred calls and and the load in terms of both uh, the number of units you have at a station versus uh, the location of stations. We haven't yet, in part because, as I said, this is the first time that anyone proposes this sort of thing, so we're starting small. And uh, we're using a mixed interior linear program to solve the, this, um, and it's not computationally very efficient. So we cannot go, so this is why I said we need to go with larger networks and, and bigger instance sets. Uh, we cannot go with that yet because computationally it would take us forever to solve. So we're now looking into some heuristics uh, to okay. solve that so we can address larger networks with larger instance sets. And you're not going to publish anything in terms of what you've done so far in terms of a written paper? We will. We will. We are We are preparing now a draft to submit in the next month or so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Menendez. Hi, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, hi. Thank you so much for the very nice presentation. It's fascinating. Uh, and, and I appreciate your uh, contribution to us this late. Um, so I, I'm also working on uh, this area and uh, published uh, several, several papers uh, on modular and autonomous vehicles. Uh, and I think this is a very interesting t topic. And we, we, we had some algorithm uh, developments for simpler problems, <laughs> some simpler problems than uh, what you're looking for. And we can uh, talk more, uh, you know, after this whether we could uh, uh absolutely collaborations or something absolutely uh, yeah you you had a paper with joe right with joe with joseph Chow? Uh, yeah joseph Chow, we, we have a proposal uh, we have a project <laughs> ah, a project okay i i knew you guys yeah, yeah. were connected somehow on this okay yeah, yeah. yeah sure and, we can and, let's yeah. let's catch up um i yeah. love it. i would love it and, and I, I think i talked with uh, Tommaso uh, Jing, uh, I can recall his last name. That, that that's yeah, the one from next CTO, right? Next, right? Yeah, they, they're doing great stuff. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's it's interesting technology, and then, you know, I had uh, some students also exploring that. We we can talk more about it. And uh, absolutely, uh, I, yeah. I think it opens the door for many. In many, in many fields, I think they have so far they hadn't think they hadn't thought or they haven't thought, as far as I know, about emergency medical services. But they're advertising that a lot for public transport, and now they're starting to advertise for logistics as well. Yeah, and for emergency service, I see actually the problem structure is uh, uh, actually has some similarity or relation to fire. Uh, rescue, yeah. because for fire rescue, several different vehicles may need to have a combination to come uh, to serve a place. So, so there is that component of vehicle combinations. You know, we could also. Uh, yeah, we, we, I, I was working on with with someone about the fire um, station settings or location or something, but but the, the modular vehicle idea could be also introduced uh, to to that context. Uh, just to. Um, 
And I want to mention similar ideas actually um, has been started by combining helicopter or future um, EV tours with the um, ground vehicles in the medical emergency response. So I and, and there was also a study, I think, in Delft, uh, but I'm not sure how far along that study was, combining drones with emergency response vehicles, uh, where drones will provide the basic instrumentation for, um, you know, when you have a cardiac arrest that they need the, fib the fibrillator, I don't know how to say it properly, but that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I think emergency medical services hasn't been studied as much as other fields or hasn't been improved that much. It has probably been studied, but I think there's a lot of room to grow because when disasters hit, uh, or the pandemic, right? The, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah um, I think it started extensively by a lot of the OR people, but not maybe on this module in our vehicle concept, but um, on the station locations and yes, on the station location and the dispatching uh, logic. But if you, if, from what I understand, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on, on medical on emergency medical services, but the logic for dispatching is typically a rule based logic, right? So it's either a first first call in, and so there's not a lot of a strategy behind the dispatching uh, algorithms for emergency medical services. Yeah. yeah. Well, great, thank you. I guess the students might want, want to also ask yeah, some questions. This is re really nice. Uh, I, I'll probably have to go to another meeting, but but, uh, but it's very nice to, to have you. I understand we're running over time, so I can stay online, but if anyone le needs to leave, don't feel bad. I fully okay. understand we're running 15 minutes over time. Yeah, sure. Okay. We'll send you some papers and let, we will talk later. Thank you. Thank you, Chopin. Bye. Bye-bye. Let's say two more minutes to see if anybody has the last question. Yes, um, Eduardo Godinez. Eduardo. <laughs> Eduardo, <laughs> I tried to pronounce it, sorry. Yes, I had a question. Would there, like for any of the transports, uh, would there be any type of like modification to like roadways to like accommodate for them or would they just operate like any normal vehicle? No, they operate as any normal vehicle. Actually, they have done some pilot testing here in Dubai. Um, I say here in Dubai, Dubai is the city next to Abu Dhabi. Um, so they don't need any special from uh, what I know. They don't need any special infrastructure. Uh, they haven't been, as far as I know, they haven't been fully deployed anywhere yet. So mm -hmm. thank you. And okay, the last question will be uh, Zhi Wei, Zhi Wei Chen, Tom, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Nanavda, thank you for your um, insightful presentation. I am actually one of Dr. Lee's students who is currently working on the same topic. And I'm currently looking at um, how modular autonomous vehicles might affect congestion in cities. So I saw that you've um, considered how bus and car traffic uh, interact with each other in the network, but I'm wondering if you have analyzed how um, different penetration rates um, of modular autonomous vehicles will affect the congestion pattern in the network. So we haven't looked at the microscopic interactions between the two. So if, if, if that's part of the question, we haven't looked, we, we have looked at this at a microscopic level using kind of a, the MFD. And we haven't, well, we're, um, as part of this analysis, we haven't taken into account the fact that they're autonomous or automated. We are assuming we're looking at the space they take and the fact that they're stopping at, at the bus stops. You know, we're treating them as if they were public, regular public transport vehicles, they might just be a different lens, right? But we haven't really looked at them as how would they affect network as autonomous vehicles and whether autonomous vehicles behave in slightly different and that affect in a slightly different way. We haven't done so. I see. And uh, do you think, um, is it possible to like incorporate that dimension into your current model, into the, the um, Certainly you could, uh, but if we would add additional, you know, add more 
complexity, the model right now is fairly, uh, it's not that trivial. Uh, so it will add more complexity and what will be interesting to see is whether you will get any benefits out of it. Uh, or, you know, is it, would, would the fact that it's autonomous really make a difference on, on traffic? Or, you know, or is it just a vehicle that no one is driving? In, in suspecting that set of interactions will be important to take a look at at the microscopic level, right? So not at the network level, not, you know, I'm looking at a very aggregated level uh, for that, for the interactions. And I'm assuming with the reaction times, with the, you know, the gap between vehicles, et cetera. And those are more microscopic things, right? So you might have to have some model or something that accounts for these microscopic interactions, which we don't have right now. Is it possible to do it? Certainly, uh, but it would add complexity. So the question is whether complexity will be justified or not. And my first reaction is probably not, but I might be wrong. All right, thank, thank you so much for, for, for the answer. Okay, You're great. Welcome. I really want to thank you again for taking the time, especially late uh, in your nights, to give the presentation. And it's a very interesting topic. And I think you know our audience really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. And thank everybody for joining us. And um, we will not have the seminar next week. 